to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Lord Jesus, make us worthy in the abundance of your grace and mercy to glorify your resurrection with pure hearts, to celebrate your victory with holy hymns, and to proclaim your might with pure tongues. We thank you for your love and worship you, crying out, Christ is risen, he is truly risen. To you be glory, to your Father, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace be with the church and her children. Praise, glory, honor, and praise the living and immortal one who gave life to his people by his cross and salvation to his church and happiness to his flock by his resurrection. When he appears, he shall give joy to his inheritance. To the good one be glory and honor on this feast and all the days of our lives and forever. We worship and praise you, only begotten Son. You descended into the darkness of the tombs and worked wonders in the realm of the dead. By your resurrection you freed the captives, and by your voice you awakened the righteous and the just, who had gone to their rest in the sleep of death. You gather the nations to worship you and to proclaim your salvation. They rejoice and they cry out. On Friday the king endured pain and was crucified, and today victory has been achieved by his resurrection. On Friday a lance pierced his holy side, and today in his compassion the waters of baptism flow. On Friday he was crowned with thorns, and today he has adorned his church with a crown of splendor. 
Today is the day of rejoicing in the resurrection. Today is the day of rejoicing for all who have gone to their rest in the hope of the resurrection. Today, with the fragrance of this incense, the church and her children celebrate and sing hymns of glory, saying, O Creator of life, you have saved us by your passion and have given us life by your resurrection. Now renew our image by your grace. Clothe our bodies with the power of the Spirit so that we may shine in the robe of glory and in its light to see you, the true bridegroom. In your grace make us and all the faithful departed worthy of your heavenly kingdom, that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your Father, and to your Holy Spirit forever. Sacrificed yourself for us, we give you thanks. O incense of forgiveness, we worship you, for you have brought us close to your Father, enriched us by your birth, purified us by your baptism, sanctify us by your crucifixion, reconciled us to the Father by your resurrection, raised us up by your ascension, and adorned us with the gifts of your Holy Spirit. Now, O Lord, accept our incense and fill us always with your sweet fragrance, so that our tongues may never cease in giving thanks to you forever. Amen. <clears throat> Yeah. 
Glory to the Lord of Paul and the Apostles. May the mercy of God descend upon the reader, the listeners, and upon this parish and her children forever. Brothers and sisters, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you once lived following the age of this world following the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the disobedient. All of us once lived among them in the desires of our flesh, following the wishes of the flesh and the impulses, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of the great love he had for us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, brought us to life with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. Raise us up with him and seated, at, seated us with him in the heavens in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come, he might know the immeasurable riches of his grace in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For by grace, you have been saved through faith, and this is not from you, it is the gift of God. It is not from works, so no one may boast, for we are his handiwork, created in Christ Jesus for the good works that God has prepared in advance, that we should live in them. Praise be to God always. Before the proclamation of the gospel of our Savior announcing life for our souls, we offer this incense and ask for your mercy, O Lord. Peace be with you. 
From the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. John, who proclaimed life to the world. Let us listen to the proclamation of life and salvation for our souls. Remain silent, O listener, for the Holy Gospel is about to be proclaimed to you. Listen and give glory and thanks to the word of the living God. The Apostle John writes, When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, Feed my lambs. He then said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was distressed that he had said to him a third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Amen, amen, I say to you, when you were younger, you used to dress yourself and to go where you wished. But when you grow old, you shall stretch out your hands, and another, another will dress you and lead you where you do not wish to go. He said this signifying by what kind of death he would glorify God. And when he had said this, he said to him, follow me. This is the truth, peace be with you. Even when we were dead in our sins, God has enlivened us together in Christ, by whose grace you have been saved. <clears throat> in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Each of us would like to think, or would like to think, that our lives obviously have purpose and value, more than just simply my own personal interest, that we have some impact on the world around us. And of course, in God's plan, each of us do when we correspond to that plan. But you'll notice a contrast that's written in the second chapter of the letter to the Ephesians. That St. Paul says, he reminds the Ephesians, you were once like everybody else in the world, following after idols, living for your own selfish ends, children of wrath. It's a really strong term. Children of wrath meaning, remember how we've talked about a son of peace, the son of man. In the Semitic terms, using this term bara, benai, children, it's not just simply saying it's the offspring of something, but we are related to that. The, the, son of, the son of peace, a son of peace, is not just simply a man who is peaceful, but he has a relational ship with peace. That's how profound it is. Not just that he's a nice person. The children of the wrath are not just simply following their own selfish ends within creation. They have a relationship with the repercussions that will come from that of the wrath of God in punishment and injustice. It's a very strong term at the beginning of the second chapter. So what is St. Paul doing is he's giving us a larger vision of what takes place in this death and resurrection of our Lord. In chapter one, and again, as always, I encourage you to read these texts in fuller than just simply the small quotations we have as we read for the liturgy. 
But in chapter 1, St. Paul speaks about this glory that takes place within Christ as the cosmic transformation, that God not only enters into time, transforms this human nature by becoming man, but that also in his resurrection, in his ascension, in his glory at the right hand of the Father, he recapitulates everything in creation, the entire universe, under one head, recapitulation, kaput, head. So St. Paul in the first chapter talks about this kind of cosmic vision. Then what he does in the first part of chapter 2 is the quotation that we have today of how each individual is integrated within that cosmic transformation. And those who are not integrated within that cosmic transformation, they remain in opposition. They are what we call the world. And that opposition makes them children of wrath in final repercussions of their choices. And then the second part of this chapter, St. Paul will talk about how God then brings reconciliation and unity between nations and between peoples. So we have the cosmic vision of all the universe, how we as individuals through our faith and baptism are integrated into this current, and then how the nations of themselves also historically are meant to be reconciled and brought into Christ. What St. Paul is doing is he's reminding us that there's only one action that God accomplishes in the resurrection. God entering into time, the eternal one entering into time, transform transforming and healing a fallen world is only one movement of an entrance into time through the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary by embracing death to turn it on, on its head, the very effect of Adam and Eve's sin in the beginning turning it on its head by embracing it and making it turn into resurrection and life and glory and this movement in the ascension towards his glorification at the right hand of his Father. And that he will manifest this full glory at a moment in the future, the parousia. There is only one movement through all of this. And St. Paul says that we are integrated into this one movement so that Christ, who's risen in glory, we are risen, raised with him through our faith in baptism. That baptism confers upon us the ability to enter into this transformation, and our faith is what instrumentally allows us to receive it personally. That's why they are inseparable, faith and baptism. And so what happens here in chapter 2 is rather peculiar. Because what St. Paul does is he makes up words. He makes up neologisms, these new words. Because he's trying to speak about resurrection and transformation and glory and life. But not as given to us as separate from Christ. Now a lot of times in the modern world we have an idea, and it's an influence over the last four centuries, from Protestantism about me. Jesus died for me, he did this for me, and it's about me going to heaven, it's about me being saved, and about me saving my soul. But it's never been the vision of the Christian church to isolate my individual gifts separate from the body of Christ. So St. Paul is talking about that the individuals, yes, obviously we are brought into salvation, but that's not the purpose. The purpose is the manifestations of God's goodness, his compassion, his tender mercy, as St. Paul calls it. And it's one action of God manifesting. He manifests his goodness by creating. We, of course, we are loved by God, every single person. In fact, the birds that now sing. All creatures are loved by God or they wouldn't exist. He chose to make them because he loved them. But for human beings, it's even more than that. He wants us not only to be loved, that's already the fact by the, that we, we exist. But he wants us to be friends in intimacy with his life, which is why personally he enters into this world to bring us into that life of intimacy. 
And so what St. Paul is always trying to do is to talk about how this intimacy being brought together with Christ. So in this chapter, in verses 5 and 6, so when I read it to you at the beginning of the sermon, even when we were dead in sin, God enlivened us, made us live together in Christ, by whose favor, by whose grace, we're saved, or made whole. The term which is translated as made us alive, I think it's in the, in the, what you have in the bulletin says, made us alive in Christ. But the term is literally something he made up. He takes the term to quicken, to make alive, and he adds this prefix, syn, in Greek, which means with or together. So he's making compound verbs, three different places in these two lines, so that literally what the term is, not just simply being made alive in Christ, but being together alive. This, he's making one word that's saying not just that God gives you life to save your soul, but God is making you live together in the one life, which is Christ's. Which is why in the, uh, in the um, Apostles' Creed, we say that we believe in the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints. The communion of saints is that one unique life of Christ that radiates throughout the universe. And so the term that St. Paul comes up with, which is better, is not only are you given life, you are given together life. You are together raised. And he gives these words, and when you read them in the Greek, they're really quite weird because they're made up. Because he's trying to make us understand that all of humanity who accepts this invitation of love and intimacy into friendship will be brought into this glory by the same action that raised Christ from the dead. It's a totally different vision. And so within that, in verse 6, St. Paul says, and he has raised us up, together raised us, and has made us together sit in heavenly places through Christ. So that it's not just for personal good, though personal good is truly what we receive. It's not just for our personal good. But St. Paul goes on to say, but it's ordered to manifest at all times his rich favors and his tender kindness. So we go back to the original question. We'd like to know that our lives have some purpose. <coughs> it's why it's coupled together with this Gospel of St. John. Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And we've talked about it last year. We considered this text. It's the change of the verb to love, which makes Peter upset the third time. Because our Lord asks, do you love me? With a different verb, a different word for love the third time around. But you'll notice that each time, what St. Peter is doing personally is making reparation for having denied our Lord the month before, during the Passion. Personally, that's his reparation. But you notice the response of our Lord at the end of each of his answers is, feed my lambs, tend my sheep. Your life of transformation in your reparation, in your repentance, has a larger repercussion on the body politic of the church. I want you to feed my lambs. And our lives also have that same value, not to the same degree of St. Peter, of course. But last week, as these last three weeks, we considered the Blessed Virgin Mary. Who is Mary of Nazareth? And on the first week of the, when we had the crowning, we considered the fact that she's the juncture between eternity and time, the place where the Holy and Eternal One enters into the time of mankind. Last week, using the text from our liturgy, we considered the fact that it is the word that comes to this young woman, and that the word is engraved, sculpted, engraved, chiseled into the flesh of the Virgin Mary, so that the word that all of creation that is, that is loved by God could not hear or pronounce, that word, that eternal word, was engraved in the flesh and written by the pen of Mary within her very womb. She is the new Eve. 
And as Eve was first created, the human race was created in union with God. So the new Eve was also created in union with God, in grace and in favor, without merit. What's the Virgin Mary doesn't merit this stainless conception or immaculate conception as we call it. But she is created like Eve. And as Eve didn't merit her existence either, nor any of us do, because we don't exist before it. You can't merit if you don't be. So also then the Blessed Virgin Mary in her creation is also without stain or tarnish or blemish in the beginning of that new creation. And so the Blessed Virgin Mary has a very unique place. Mary of Nazareth has a very unique place in the plan of salvation. And that reciprocation and that act of her creation is dependent upon that glorification together with Christ in his glory. In time, she pre-exists him. But in eternity, obviously, her son pre-exists her. She gives birth with him in time. She is the beginning as the new Eve. As Eve was created from Adam, and Eve falls and then brings her husband into this, so the new Eve is created, and from the new Eve, the new Adam has come forth into the world. But as the old Eve was created in union with God, so the new Eve is also conceived and created in union with God. And again, her place in this world, even though her creation is not, without, is not with any kind of merit on her part, that reflection of God in her place in the plan of salvation is also, like St. Peter, a larger amplification. So when we look at the Blessed Virgin Mary individually, that she has this part in the universal mission of, create, of redemption, when we ask the question of what is the purpose of our lives, St. Paul is answering the question, what is the foundation of Christian action? What is the foundation of Christian morality? Why should we be different from the children of wrath? Why should we act any different from someone who just lives for their own self-centeredness? The St. Paul says it's because you have received much more and you have been made alive together within Christ. And because we have received this favor, this grace, this mercy and this compassion, we are meant to reflect it to those around us. It's a really heavy responsibility. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Then tend my sheep. Your responsibility is to tend the flock of God, to guide the fold, to guide this flock, this church. The Blessed Virgin Mary also recognizes her dependency. My soul magnifies my Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. That is meant to be the foundation of our Christian morality, so that we who are aware of the fact that we have received this grace within Christ, turn as a reflection and a mirror to show that same compassion and favor to those around us. It's a heavy responsibility. And it can only be done when we realize what we have received together with and in Christ. But when we receive that, then it becomes something totally different. And to love your neighbor as yourself doesn't mean, well, you're supposed to be nice. You are meant to be the reflection of God to the people around you. And when we do that, we will transmit that grace of God to others and as I've mentioned, mentioned to you a gazillion times, the gospel passes that way by knowledge of the grace of redemption, passes from person to person. When we reflect on knowing this grace, then we have the ability in loving our neighbor as ourselves to show them the face of Christ and the gospel. It's the basis of the morality, which is why he begins the quotation in this chapter by saying, you were once like everybody else. You Ephesians, you live for the same purpose and you are motivated by the same things. Which means as we sit here today that we have to realize that our motivations are not like everyone else in the world, or at least they shouldn't be. 
that they are meant to be transformed by a light which has been given to the spirit of each of our minds. And in that transformation, that question is repeated that is given to Simon Peter, son of John. Do you love me? Do you respond of the affection and the love that I have given you? Peter shuffles his feet and he never answers the question using the same terminology that our Lord uses. You can't tell it in the English, but in the Greek and the Latin, it's very obvious. And he says, Lord, you know everything. You know, you know that I love you, which is good enough. It's not the full answer he would have preferred, but it's good enough for God to work with. Feed my lambs. So we don't have to be transformed in holiness and confirmed in grace to please the Lord and to be able to move forward in the spiritual life. But we do have an obligation to at least look down a little bit, shuffle our feet, and perhaps not answer in the same terms, but saying, yes, yes, you know that I do love you. And I desire to return love for love. And when we've done that, our lives will have purpose. What will it be? How will it be? I have no idea. But at least on the day of our death, we will have the consolation of knowing that over these decades, we have been the face of Christ to others. And that through us, by the grace of God, the gospel has been spread. And on that moment of death, we know that we have been part then of a living chain coming from that day of the resurrection as we prepare for the day of his full manifestation. It's hard and it's also easy because it's not our work that we do. All that our Lord asks is respond and show a minimal amount of generosity in responding to the friendship of the divine love. And in doing that, I will do the rest. Just where the gospel ends, he looks at St. Peter and he says, you, follow me. That's all he wants. A little bit of generosity and then follow in discipleship. Which is why we can finish with verse 10 that we have for the reading today. For we are his workmanship. We are the craft that he has created in this world. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus in good works, which God has prepared so that we should walk among them, walk within these gifts and accomplish that request, follow me. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.
Lord and God, you accepted the offerings of our ancestors. Now accept these offerings that your children have brought to you. Out of their love for you and for your holy name, shower your spiritual blessings upon them, and in place of their earthly gifts, grant them life and your imperishable kingdom. Amen. As we remember our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ and his plan of salvation for us, we recall upon this offering all those who have pleased God from Adam to this day, especially Mary, the Blessed Mother of God, Saint Joseph, her spouse, Saint Mary, and Saint Jude, and Saint Charbel. Remember, O God, the children of the Holy Church, our fathers and mothers, and our brothers and sisters, both the living and the departed, especially those for whom this sacrifice is offered for the intentions of Father Chris Pacelli and for the intentions of the Catholic Extension Society and its donors. Remember also all those who share with us today in this offering. Amen. to the Holy Spirit now and forever. Amen. Lord God and Father, holy and glorious is your name. 
you deliver those who love you from all that is contrary to your will. May we who have remained in your divine love be made worthy to give one another the greeting of peace with a holy kiss. May we always speak words of peace, think of peace, and work for peace. Through the grace of your only Son and his love for all people, we raise glory to you and to your living Holy Spirit, now and forever. Peace to you, O holy altar of God. Peace to the holy mysteries placed upon you. Peace to you, O minister of God. Let each one of us give a greeting of peace to his neighbor with love and faith. reconciling those who are enemies. You are forgiveness to those who sin. You are comfort to those who are sorrowful. Open the door of your mercy to our petitions and in the abundance of your grace accept our prayers. Make us children and heirs of your kingdom through the grace of your only Son and his love for all people and through your Holy Spirit now and forever. by all angels bless you humanity exalts you and all creation glorifies you look upon your children who call out to you with purity and holiness may we offer to you an acceptable sacrifice that we may raise glory to you to your only son and to your holy spirit now and forever the Father and the grace of the only begotten Son and the communion and indwelling of the Holy Spirit be with you my brothers and sisters forever and with your spirit let us lift up our thoughts our minds and our hearts we lift them up to the Lord let us give thanks to the Lord with reverence and worship him with humility it is right and just Truly it is right and just to thank, adore, glorify, and bless the majesty of the one consubstantial Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, a majesty that does not need our glory or become greater with our thanks. O Lord, those who sing your praises are countless, and they cry out with angelic voices and with sweet melodies proclaiming. exalted our weak human nature. In your mercy you sent your only Son into the world for our salvation. He dawned from the Holy Virgin like a ray of light from a bright cloud. He took the form of a slave, yet truly he is the Son of your majesty. He willingly became man to make us divine. He was born from a woman's womb that we may be born again from a spiritual womb. 
He became our brother so that through his grace we may become your children and heirs. He took us from being slaves and made us your children. He promised us a share in the reward that allows us to call you Abba, Father. He cleansed us from our sins with his precious blood that he poured out for us. For he is your only Son. Kyrie eleison. Ubiamo haraktum harshadi lema bethayem. En sabe lachmo bida kari shantan. Ubarahu kadesh. Waksue yaber talmita karaman. Sabakhulam mehne kulukho. Hono denita. Fakhuru adiyem. Dakhlof aikun wakhlof sagiye. Me taqaseo me tihem. Khulsuyon. How may we hold on the golem alami? Ha kano al kosun damsi ho men hamra wa men mayo. Arahu kadesh. Ya bil talmi ta karamara. Sabishtaw mehne kulukhu Khunu denita Demohu dilu diya tiki khadato Dakhluf aikun wakhluf sagiyen Mekte shadu metihem Khusuyan haume wa khayin al qalam alameen Do this in memory of me each time you eat this bread and drink this cup. You remember my death until I come again. We remember your death, O Lord. We profess your resurrection. We await your second coming. We implore your mercy and compassion. We ask for the forgiveness of sins. May your mercy rest upon us. O Word of God, who can comprehend that you willingly emptied yourself of your divine glory, who can explain your miraculous birth from a virgin, who can repay you for your saving passion which you freely endured, who can praise your plan of salvation for us. We can only ask of you, O lover of all people, that this sacrifice which we have offered be accepted on your holy altar in heaven, the dwelling place of your hidden divinity in the company of all the angels and saints. Through this sacrifice may we be worthy of the forgiveness of our sins. When you come to judge the living and the dead, do not pass judgment upon us, nor deny us, saying, I do not know you. On that glorious and fearful day, do not separate us from you, nor cast us out of your paradise to a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. Rather, because of your holy name by which we have been called, look with mercy upon us. In your compassion you have made us worthy of the gift of your forgiving body and blood. So make us worthy to be one with you in holiness as you are one with your Father. For this your church implores you and through you and with you implores your Father, saying, Have mercy on us, Almighty Father, have mercy on us. O Lord, as we, your sinful children, receive your graces, we thank you for them and because of them. We praise you, we bless you, we adore you, we glorify you, we profess our faith in you and we ask you, have compassion on us, O God, how awesome is this moment, O oh my beloved, for the living Holy Spirit descends and rests upon this offering for our sanctification. Let us stand with reverence as we pray. 
Manin Morio, Manin Morio, Manin Morio, Nite Modro Hohayo Kadisho, Onahena Lainu Ad Korbono Hono. The body of Christ our God be for us a pledge of the life to come, a body that grants us the everlasting joys of heaven, a body that renews our souls and bodies, a body that purifies us of all sin for eternal life. Amen. And let the mixture in this chalice, the blood of Christ our God, be a blood that gives new life to those who receive it, a blood that guides us to the safe harbors and the dwellings of light. A blood that renews our souls and bodies, a blood that purifies us of all sin for eternal life. Amen. O Lord, in your great mercy, when this body and blood is mingled with our bodies and souls, grant that it may be for the pardon of faults, the forgiveness of sins, and the everlasting joy and eternal life with all your saints. We offer you, Lord God, this pure and holy offering for your holy, Catholic, and apostolic Church, which you have redeemed. Gather her children into unity, love, and faith, and guide them in peace and security. We offer it for the pure bishops of the true faith, Francis, the Pope of Rome, Bashar Peter, our Patriarch of Antioch, Gregory John, our Bishop, the Venerable Priests, the Chaste Deacons, the Pure Subdeacons, and all the Orders of the Church. Teach them the word of truth so that they may spread it faithfully with justice and holiness. May they take care, care for the flock that you have entrusted to them. Give them the proper means to accomplish your will and grant them a long life. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord of goodness, your holy church, and have mercy on all her faithful. In your compassion, heal all the wounded and injured among your flock. Punish injustice, strengthen all our brothers and sisters. Bestow the grace of conversion on all. With your indestructible power, strengthen the bishops of the true faith, that they may be upright and courageous in their apostolic office. May they show fidelity as they stand ever before your eternal justice. Unto your honor and glory, May they prove themselves upright, dauntless, and persevering in the task confided to them. To lead all the faithful into the fullness of your redeeming light and glory. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the poor and dejected, for orphans and widows, for the sick and distressed, for those tempted by evil spirits. Be the guardian and refuge of their lives. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember the Holy Fathers, prophets, apostles, preachers, evangelists, martyrs, and confessors, especially the holy, glorious, and blessed ever-Virgin Mary, Mother of God, St. John the Baptist, the messenger and forerunner who witnessed the betrothal of your holy church to your son, glorious Saint Stephen the archdeacon and first martyr, and all who pleased you and professed your name, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all the faithful departed who have gone to you from this altar and from every place throughout the world, grant them rest in your heavenly dwellings with all your saints, and in your mercy forgive our sins and theirs. And grace go down to the departed, and forgive the sins we have committed, with or without full knowledge. O oh Lord, do not deprive us of your mercy, but keep us in the palm of your hand, lest we fall and go astray, so that we may walk on your paths, follow your ways, and do your will. Forgive us and our departed, and pardon all sins and transgressions, hidden and seen, committed with or without full knowledge, 
Make us worthy of a faithful Christian death that is pleasing to you, and join us to your righteous ones and to all those who have done your will, that in us and in all things your blessed name may be glorified with the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and of your living Holy Spirit, now and forever. As it was, is now, and shall be forever. sent us your only Son, who is the radiance of your eternity. And he accomplished his plan of salvation for us, so that we may come to you. May we call upon you with the prayer that he taught his holy disciples, the saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, So merciful Lord, we ask for your compassion. By your grace, make us worthy that your glorious name be made holy in us, that your kingdom come to assist us in our weakness, and that your will dwell within us. Deliver us from all difficult temptations. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours with your only Son and your Holy Spirit now and forever. Amen. Peace be with you. And with your spirit. Bow your heads before the God of mercy, before his forgiving altar, and before the body and blood of our Savior who gives life to those who partake of him, and receive the blessing from the Lord. O Lord God, you are good and the lover of all people. Look upon those who bow their heads before your majesty, and bless them with every spiritual blessing. Do not turn us away when we approach your divine and holy gifts. And let us not be guilty of unworthily receiving the body and blood of your only Son. Rather, make us worthy to share in your holy and life-giving mysteries with purity, that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your only Son, and to your good and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. The grace of the Most Holy Trinity, eternal and consubstantial, be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. Let each one of us look to God with reverence and humility and ask him for mercy and compassion. Holy gifts for the holy, with perfection, purity, and sanctity. One, one holy, holy Father, one holy Son, one holy Spirit. Blessed be the name of the Lord, for he is one in heaven and on earth. To him be glory forever. Make us worthy of the Lord our God. So that our bodies may be sanctified by your holy body. 
and our souls purified by your forgiving blood. May our communion be for the forgiveness of our sins and for new life. O Lord our God, to you be glory forever.
Lord Jesus, you have made us worthy to share in your holy body and in the cup of salvation. How can we repay you for these your gifts and graces and for your goodness? As you have called us to approach this life-giving banquet, make us worthy, so that your body may be mingled with our bodies and your blood with our souls, for the pardon of faults, the forgiveness of sins, and eternal life. You are blessed and your kingdom is holy, and we raise glory to you, to your Father, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace be with you. And with your spirit. O God the Father, we bow before you and we entrust ourselves to your care. We ask you, imploring your mercy, to rest your right hand full of blessings upon us. Assist us, protect us, bless us, and sanctify us by the Holy Cross of your only Son. We glorify and honor you, your only Son, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. <clears throat> so as you notice in the bulletin, we have an, a letter from uh, Bishop Gregory announcing the death of our previous patriarch, um, Patriarch Spire. <coughs> he was a tremendous giant. He was the patriarch during the civil war that lasted for 15 years in Lebanon. He's a very small man, but a powerhouse of strength. I first met him when I was in Lebanon in 2010. We met him in Bekerke. He was already in his 90s then. And his impressive example for us of strength and determination in following our Lord is one to be admired and imitated. And so towards the end of this month, we will have three masses being offered for the repose of his soul. So I encourage you all heartily to pray that God lead him into the full, fullness of the light of his kingdom and into the dwellings of joy. Go in peace, my beloved brothers and sisters, with the nourishment and blessings you have received from the forgiving altar of the Lord. May the blessing of the Most Holy Trinity accompany you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, the one God, to whom be glory forever. Thank you. 